many people in here like have tried the paleo diet? Anybody done paleo? All right, good. How about this whole fasting, intermittent fasting? Anyone done that? Keto, keto. Okay, okay. Man, these are really popular diets, aren't they? Lifestyles, we say. How many people in here like to CrossFit? If you're a CrossFitter, man, that's a tough thing to do. Okay, all right. Anyone enjoy yoga? Yeah, yoga, excellent. How about just bodybuilding? That's what I do. It's funny to, to ask that question to a crowd this size because on one hand, we're into health. We like organic foods and vegetables and fruits and plant-based diets. and We, we wanna know the backdrop and the background of everything we put into our bodies, right? Forks over knives, we say. On one hand, we are into that. On one hand, we're very healthy, on the other, Maybe not so much. I read recently where we consume, an average American consumes an average of 24 pounds of candy, candy per year. That's a lot. You ever pick up a 25 pound dumbbell? The average person is eating that much candy. And when it comes to Christmas, Christmas is uh, very candy-centric. Of course, you have Valentine's, you have Easter, you have Halloween, you have Christmas, and we spent billions of dollars each holiday season just on candy. The king of the Christmas candy has got to be the candy cane. Two billion are sold, two billion. So when you look at the candy cane, at least I do, I, I think about Christmas. And for those of you who are into useless you know, facts and, and, and data that doesn't really matter, the largest candy cane in history was 51 feet long. And this cane goes all the way back, the history of it, to the 1600s. I thought that was interesting. Have you ever researched the candy cane? I have. The candy cane started out straight. It didn't start out crooked. Back in the 1600s, kids were acting like kids and some, some wise people, teachers and pastors and other people gave them sugar sticks and they were quiet for a while. But they didn't understand the sugar high and then the crash and all that, but that's how it started. And from there, somewhere along the way, people began to bend the cane. Is this interesting or what? I can tell you're like, wow, I was just thinking about that this morning. Why are the candy canes bent? I'm gonna tell you. And some people say they're bent, they're, they're crooked to hang on a tree, because that was back in the day when you would put food on a tree, remember that? Well, you shouldn't because you weren't living. But history tells us that they did that. Now others contend that, that the bend happened because of the shepherds, the squad of shepherds, they were the first ones to, to hear the good news of Jesus being born, and they were the first responders. So that's uh, basically the history of the candy cane. It's white and red and it, this, it's really hard. This one is so hard, I can knock someone out easy with that. <laughs> so don't charge the stage. I'll just knock you silly with this. So right now I thought, you know, it's the Christmas season. I wanna give everyone here, that's right, a candy cane. Not this big, but a miniature candy cane. So now, our candy cane kids will come out and hand everyone a candy cane here and at all of our different campuses in Norman, Oklahoma, downtown Dallas, in fabulous Frisco, in Fort Worth, at Lasso Ranch, Miami, in the no-no, Northport, everybody. Candy. Candy! The candy cane. Now don't eat this candy yet. Don't eat the candy, I know it's tempting. I know it is. Everyone gets a cane, it's a free gift. It's a gift 
from us to you. I want to talk a little bit about the candy cane over the next couple of moments, 19 minutes and 51 seconds and counting. I can do it. I feel pretty confident. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, Psalm 34 verse 8, it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Isn't it true that we take refuge in candy? During the holidays, I've been researching candy and specifically the peppermint flavor. It's high in antioxidants. It helps calm us down. A study in 2008 said that when students take and eat peppermint candy, it improves their concentration. I was blown away by that. Also, there's you know, a healing aspect to, to peppermint. I'm having surgery tomorrow, did you know that? Yeah, I have a hernia, see this? It's almost like I have a second nose, look at this, look at this. When I had heart surgery several years ago, for some reason, maybe because I lift so much weight, you know, uh, I felt this thing poking out and they said, you need to get that fixed, so I'm gonna get it fixed. It's a quick surgery tomorrow, so, so be in prayer. I'm gonna recover with pain medication and the candy cane. But I'll be back, it's like, you know, just you'll, you'll be sore for a couple of days and you know, whatever. But pray for me tomorrow. I'm not really worried. I mean, when you've had a five hour heart surgery compared to that, <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing. The candy cane, the ingredients, sugar, water, peppermint oil. Say it with me, sugar, water, and peppermint oil. It's an antioxidant. It helps with bad breath too. You ever have bad breath? I do. Man, my breath sometimes is so bad. I was in Long Island a couple of days ago speaking to a bunch of pastors and I could tell my breath started to reek. Well, there I am. I didn't have a toothbrush. I didn't have any peppermint. I'm interviewing some of these pastors and talking to them and I could tell that my breath was bad because you can kind of feel it, you know? And they were kind of turning their head and, and a couple of times I saw their nostrils kind of flare like. It's the candy cane. But the candy cane does represent the shepherd. Psalm 23, here's what David said. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. Even though I walk through the valley of death, you know, I'm not gonna fear evil. And then he goes on to say, my rod, being the shepherd, and the staff comforts me. And in John 10, Jesus called himself the good shepherd. So this, this whole vibe, this, this thing was out there a lot, the shepherding nature of our Lord. What does a shepherd do? I've been to Israel many times. I'm going back in a couple of weeks. If you're going to Israel, lift your hand. Everybody, wow, look. Thousands are raising their hands. You need to go. You know, I'm trying to go now at least uh, every year. A shepherd, though, uses his staff even today. They use it for direction. Direction. Sheep, and the Bible compares us to sheep. Did you know that? Sheep aren't that smart. You can lead a sheep over a cliff, and they'll go, yeah. They'll just eat their way over a cliff. That's why we are compared to sheep. The, the Bible says, as far as our sin nature, we like sheep have gone astray. It's a scripture now. Each of us has gone our own way. We need direction. Not only do we need direction, also with this, with this staff, protection. The good shepherd would protect. Pack of wolves would come by. <laughs> And the sheep would be like, ah, this is what a shepherd would do. Have you ever just thought about the fact that Jesus directs you and me? He directs us through his word. He directs us through his spirit. We have to submit ourselves to him. Lord, you're my shepherd. I'm not the shepherd. You're my leader and my feeder and provider. I'm not. 
When we get to heaven, I guarantee it, we're gonna look back and go, unbelievable. That's amazing how many times, God, you protected me from forces, from things, from temptations, from cliffs that I was totally unaware of. Moreover, God has protected you and me from things that we've seen. I look back on my life. I look back and go, thank you, God, for protecting me when I was a high school student. I can give you opportunity after opportunity after situation after situation that I was involved in, yet supernaturally, God protected me from that influence, from that group of people, from going down that path, from walking down that cliff. So when you look at the candy cane, I want you to think about that. Think about the direction, think about about the protection. Also think about how God disciplines us and corrects us. It's not taught about a lot, it's not preached about a lot. God disciplines those he loves, the Bible says. Think about a good shepherd, as I've researched shepherds. If a sheep in the sheepfold would keep on wandering off, do you know what a good shepherd would do? He would track down the sheep using his staff, break the leg of the sheep. Wow, that sounds cruel, stay with me. Then he would mend the broken leg. That wayward sheep would be totally and completely dependent upon the shepherd when he or she was being healed of the broken leg. And you know when that leg was healed, that sheep wasn't even thinking about running off again. God disciplines you. He disciplines me. Sometimes, sometimes he has to break us, to mold us and make us so we'll rely on the good shepherd. Have you ever thanked God for breaking you in certain areas? The thing about a candy cane is, when you, when you eat a candy cane, not yet, <laughs> rarely, unless you have a giant mouth like I do, I've, my, my mouth is the size of a large mouth bass, but rarely do you just pop it in your mouth. You normally break it and share it. The shepherd's staff. Now also too, the shepherd's staff, is for inspection. You know something that, again, we don't really talk about a lot is when Jesus will separate the sheep from the goats. We say, oh, he's a goat, she's a goat, the greatest of all time. I got a new acrostic for you. If you're a goat, it's gonna be the greatest omission of all time. To this day, In Israel, this staff is used to separate, to separate. Those of us who are in Christ, we live forever. We're all facing a forever, a forever with Jesus as we glorify God. Those who are goats, people who had opportunities, they will be, because they chose to do so, they will be banished to an eternal hell. And what is hell? Hell is doing anything and everything you've always wanted to do alone. So think about this. Think about this, this this cane. Think about the shepherd's staff, what it represents. I want you to notice something else as we zoom in to the cane, as as we really get close. As I talked about earlier, this is crooked. We sometimes say, oh man, she's a crook. He's a crook. And we think, oh, criminals, crooks are in prison. That's not true. I said, that's not true. We're all crooks. We're all crooked. I'm a crook, you're a crook. We're we're, we're in prison, we're incarcerated, we're slaves to sin. 
We're not born straight. I'm not a straight arrow, nor are you. God, though, took you and me. We're, we're, we're crooks. We deserve eternal damnation. God took you and me, and by his grace, he's straightened us out. We're saved by grace through faith. We don't experience it, though, until we taste and see that the Lord is good. So, so the, the, the cane represents our sinfulness. Notice what God did for us. See, see the red stripes? That's the blood of Jesus. Sin has to have a payment. And throughout scripture, this began in the book of Genesis. You know, man messed up. An innocent third party's blood was shed. Then their sins were atoned for. And throughout the Old Testament, this situation happened. And then we have, you remember back when, when Moses led the children of Israel out of the promised land? You remember that? You remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, here's what happened. They took an unblemished lamb, killed it, took its blood, and took the hyssop plant and used it sort of as a paintbrush, and they painted the blood on the door of their homes. The death angel passed over the homes who had the blood applied by the hyssop plant. And the hyssop plant is peppermint. <laughs> Just slap somebody appropriately and say, that's unbelievable. <laughs> is that crazy? Moreover, when Jesus was dying on the cross for our sins, they took a sponge, soaked it in sour wine, and used the hyssop branch to elevate it to his mouth, which he refused. Again, slap somebody appropriately and say, man, the Bible is unreal. It's about the blood. It's about the blood. Have you ever had blood work before? We all have had blood work. I had to have some blood work a couple of days ago, you know, preparing for surgery and all of that blood work. It was kind of interesting, the, the lady, hopefully she doesn't go to one of our many campuses, but the lady who was, who was taking my blood, she started on the outside of my arm. And I'm like, I've never had that happen before. And then she went to the, I'm gonna have to stick you again. Oh, all right, okay, you know. And, and throughout the, the, the process, she goes, are you okay, are you okay? I go, why are you asking me? She said, a lot of guys faint. Did you know that? When their blood is drawn. Not women, guys are just, I said, yeah, I'm doing great. Blood work. Well, the blood of Jesus works, doesn't it? When he finished his work on the cross, he spilled his blood for your sins and mine, thereby giving us an opportunity to become, see the dominant color, as white as snow. The candy cane. Will this preach or what? Think about the significance. So we have the purity, Isaiah chapter one, verse 18 says, once we receive Christ. We have the holiness of God, the righteousness of Christ. Isaiah 118, let's read it together. One, two, three, at all the campuses. Though your sins are like scarlet, I'll make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. And then 2 Corinthians chapter five, verse 21, illustrates it further. Let's say it together. God made him who had no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This cane is like some deep stuff. It's a thing a shepherd used, a tool, right? It's crooked, I'm crooked, and wow, Jesus shed his blood for me on the cross and, and then I have the righteousness of Jesus. It, if I turn it upside down, J, for Jesus, and it's hard. I mean, that, that hurts. We have an opportunity either to build our lives on the foundation of the promises of God or on shifting sand. We have that opportunity. And again, I'll tell you, it's the sovereignty of God and the free will of man, I say it all the time. We cannot figure God out. His ways are higher than our ways. 
He is mysterious yet magnificent. He is massive yet microscopic. We have a choice in the matter, yet God knows the choice before we make the choice. If you can try to figure that out, uh, great, it'll take you uh, the rest of your life. And then one day when you go from this life to glory, oh, okay, I wasn't even thinking on the same terms as you, God. I don't know why I wasted all my time worrying about it. So there's some things that are just a mystery. I cannot explain it, yet we have a choice. Are you building your life on something solid or on shifting sand? Because the promises of God are solid. As I alluded to earlier, you know, when you take the candy cane out of the packaging, and and if you think about the packaging, Jesus uh, was packaged in swaddling clothes, right? The incarnation of Jesus, he had skin on. It's, it's, It's to be shared, so we break it, and then we share it. Are you, are you sharing Jesus? Oh, we have an opportunity right now to share Jesus. We have so many situations and conversations, and spiritual conversations are easier during this time of year. We have so many, many, many opportunities, maybe 30 some odd Christmas services at all of our locations. Surely you can invite some people to fellowship. A couple of days ago, I walked in the store and I know the, the, the folks that own this little shop and I, I brought the invitations, our little cards that we give out. And I go, hey, I wanna pass these around. And these people go to church once a year. And I'm not even sure if they're believers. I know one guy is not the husband, the wife, I'm not so sure. So I said, here are 30 services. I said, there's no way you can tell me no 30 times. <laughs> kind of a joke. So do that. You're you're taking this candy and saying, all right. Okay, yeah. Jesus is the candy cane. Do you like that free gift we gave you? Salvation is a free gift. But you know what? That candy is not free. There's no such thing as anything free. Do you know how much that candy cost? Right at $1,000. Thousands and thousands and thousands of little candy canes we gave out to everyone here and at all of our different locations, cost $1,000. Some of you were thinking that was free. I mean, I think stupid thoughts like that too. Hey, this is free, it just happened. (laughs) No, and think, use your hard head for a second. It costs us something. Salvation's free. Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose again. Free, but it cost God everything. (laughs) Jesus, have you consumed Jesus? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Have Have you received him? You can say, well, yeah, I believe it's a candy cane. Great. I think it tastes like peppermint. Awesome. I know the history of the candy cane. Cool. I know it's about direction and perfection and correction and inspection and all those little words, those rhymes the Ed gave me, great. I know Jesus called himself the good shepherd in John 10, awesome. Have you received the gift of eternal life? Have you tasted it? Has it gone inside of you? Does it, does it control you? Has Jesus take up residency in your heart? That's the issue. Because it doesn't mean anything until we eat it. See, if you're hungry, he's the bread of life. If you're thirsty, he's the living water. If you're blind, he's the light of the world. If you're lost, he is the way, the truth, and the life. If you're confused, he is solid. If you're bitter, he's the candy cane. Taste and see that the Lord is 
Let's pray together. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, Father, we thank you for this, this object lesson. I thank you that we can look at this candy cane and realize the history of it. And if you're here right now, or at one of our churches, you might find yourself in Miami, you might find yourself in Northport, Fort Worth, Dallas, Briscoe, other places. Maybe you're online. Maybe you're watching this by television somewhere. You can pray a prayer right now and Jesus will come into your life. You can taste and see that the Lord is good. How do I do that, Ed? By praying this prayer. Just say this prayer with me. You can say it to yourself. Everyone, everyone. Just say, dear God, I admit to you that I am a sinner, that I'm, that I'm crooked and I deserve eternal separation from you. I turn from that and I turn to you. I believe, Lord, that you sent Jesus to, to shed his blood on the cross for my sins, to rise again. And at this moment in time, I ask you, say this, I ask you, Jesus, to come into my life to penetrate the soils of myself, of everything I'm about. I open the lid of my life and ask you to come in. And the moment you said that, Christ will forgive you, he'll cleanse you, a seismic shift will take place in your life. Just say, Jesus Christ, I ask you to come into my life. I turn from my sins and I turn to you, Jesus. I wanna taste and see that you're good. All it takes. It's just a taste. As our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'm gonna ask you to do something. If you prayed that prayer with me for the first time and meant it to the best of your ability, I want you to do something. As our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want you to lift your hand just for a second. Lift your hand and keep your hand up because we have some hosts who are gonna give you, as our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, a Bible and some information about what it means to walk and to live with Jesus. So many hands are going up. I know hands are going up. Whether you're in Florida, whether you're in Norman, Oklahoma, our beautiful campus there right off 35, right near the University of Oklahoma. You're hearing me. You're seeing it. We have something we want to give to you. We're one church in many, many locations. Keep your hand up. Our host will give you. Here's another one right here. Here's another one right here in the middle. Right here in the middle. Yep. Right here. Make sure we see all these hands. We'll give you, again, a Bible, a next step, what it means to walk with Jesus, and a Connect card so you can fill out some information. There's another block of us. We've, we've been Christians, but it's time for us to, to assign a name to this candy cane, to literally break it and share it. Who do you need to share this candy cane with? I just did this a couple of days ago. And my friends will be coming to one of the, I think 30 some odd services, who knows, at fellowship. Isn't it awesome that we have a church that gives people that many opportunities to hear about the candy cane of Christmas? Jesus. So thank you for this time. And let's all give everyone a huge round of applause. So many hands went up here and I know in all of our locations.